Hello and welcome. In this video, I'm going to be responding to two comments. The first comment is, I have a question. Maybe it's a bit stupid. A comment, a question is never stupid. If you don't know something, ask. That's how you learn. But I've never been to a brand luxury before now. And I'm thinking of going there and I would like to know how to behave as a good customer. My question is, can I independently take the items, touch them, try on the shoes alone, for example, without the help of an essay. And then the second comment is, Bernard needs to be stopped. And I'm going to be giving my thoughts on um, how you can stop him. I'm Anna Susa Gonda, and I produce educational luxury content for anyone after the finer things, whether you're young and starting out in life and wanting to reap the benefits of buying better quality from the get-go or you're into luxury, but you want to focus more on high quality, under the radar brands, or you're new to money and wanting to learn how to navigate the terrain, then my content is geared towards you. With regards to the first comment, yes, you can. You can take the shoes and independently look at them. And you can do that with pretty much all luxury products, even if it's a luxury product that's being kept behind a secure glass door in a glass cabinet, for example. Once you've asked for it, you can independently look at it and just enjoy it and have a little play, provided, of course, you don't do two things. Uh, you walk out as if you're stealing, or you can walk out, but if you wanna look at something, um, how it looks in natural light, but you'd need to tell them and then you go out with someone, or, if you look as if you're about to break something, you're handling something in a way that looks as if you're about to possibly break or you could possibly damage it, but you can independently look at things and enjoy them, looking specifically at shoes. Depending on the type of store you go to will also influence just how easy and enjoyable the independent experience will be. There are three scenarios that come to mind. The first is going to, for example, a luxury department store where they have a concession for the particular brand you'd like to look at. Um, I'm based primarily in London, so I'm thinking of department stores like Selfridges. They have a fairly sizable shoe department. I think it's on the second floor if they haven't changed it. And then Harrods, for example, have Shoe Heaven on the fifth floor. And it's a fairly big part of the store, section of the store on the fifth floor. And it's fairly big. There are staff, nine times out of 10 when you arrive, staff are typically talking to each other. And unless you look as if you are looking for help or you need something, they'll typically just leave you to get on with things. So I would recommend going somewhere like there, a department store, a big department store, and going at a time where it's quiet in the morning, early afternoon, after the lunch rush, in the morning. You, know, you typically don't have a lot of people. And also depends on the time of, type of year. And of course, I'm talking busy times like summer, Christmas, Easter period. Holiday times are going to be busy, but quieter times of the day and year, go into a luxury department store and you can take a look at the items and try them on, provided your size is there, then you get on with it. Even if you do ask for a different size or color, like you suggested in your comment, you can still very comfortably take the shoes and thank you and say, thank you. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm just going to take a look at the shoes, try them on and if I need any help, I will come back to you. It's very easy to say that. And it's not something that's unusual or rude. It's all in how you say it, but just merely saying thank you for the item. I'll have a little play with it. I'm going to try on the shoes. And if I need any other help, I'll come back to you. You've communicated, they know what's going on and you just get on with it. Then the other two scenarios are going into the brand's showroom. Without an appointment, you walk in, you see what you like, and they'll typically greet you when you arrive um, and find out if you're looking for something in particular or if they can help with anything. And you can ask for the shoes. Once you have the shoes, just say thank you. Uh, do you mind if I just have a little play, try them on, and if I need any other help, I will let you know. The other scenario is still going to the brand's showroom or their store, but you have an appointment. That becomes fairly tricky to then say, I don't need your help because the appointment is time the store is dedicating to you. They are there to help you. In some cases, wait on your hand and foot. So it's a little bit tricky when you have an appointment to then say, I don't need your help. So it's better to just go into the store without an appointment. If you can go to the store without the appointment, some brands need an appointment and then um, just get on with it. But if you 
do go to a store where you need an appointment and you can't turn up get the shoes and then just say um can i just try them on and have a little play and then when i need help i'll come straight back to you you can still do that and they will wander off and stand a little distance away or they'll go into the back or somewhere and busy themselves with some with something until you ask for further help or you are ready to leave so i hope i've answered your question i've understood your uh, question correctly but if not please don't hesitate to let me know in the comments down below and i will put together another answer for you there's a lot of content online whether it's videos or blog articles talking about bernard arnault and the vast majority of them are typically negative but regardless of what i read or watch i always can't help but think when he started louis vuitton moe hennessy in its infancy i wonder if for a second he imagined it would go on to become the beer myth that it has become the largest luxury group in the world by an absolute long shot. And it spans a number of luxury sectors. And what he's gone on and done in recent times is places children in key strategic positions um, as part of his succession plan. And that's to ensure continuity, consistency, and we're going to see the Arnaud family dominate and continue to be incredibly successful within the luxury space. So you can't ignore him. I marvel at what he has achieved and I often think if I had known what I know now <laughs> um, that I'd ultimately end up uh, creating a channel focused on luxury educational content I would have started my career 25 years ago within the luxury space worked for a luxury group and literally worked my way up from the bottom learning about the systems the processes the suppliers um, the business acumen, learning how you run a business at that level. And then once I was comfortable and confident enough in my ability and my connections, starting my own business and ensuring that I do all the things that you typically cannot do in a big organization where you have a lot of systems and structures in place that are fairly rigid for it to be successful. But in a smaller environment, improving on everything, creating an environment that's reactive, that adapts accordingly, and just replicating the magic that I'd have learned from one of the group or uh, one of the numerous brands I may have worked for in that group. And so I can't help but marvel and say, Bernard Arnault is a man who is incredibly smart. He is strategic, he's a visionary, he's shrewd, and he's surrounded himself with some of the best advisors in the world. What I would expect, and he's gone on to build an absolutely outstanding and exemplary brand. And I know consumers say he's, what he's doing is immoral. He's just incredibly smart. He's been able to capitalize on our emotions and make the most of it. And he has gone on to build some of the biggest and best luxury groups, the biggest luxury group, aspirational um, brand, uh, Louis Vuitton. So I can't help but admire and think we need to take the lessons. We need to tweak the things that work or don't work at LVMH and do better uh, in your own space, particularly if you work in the in the luxury world. And so when I look at, for example, the, the comment and the commenter went on to say it has been incredibly negative for all others involved from the creative directors, the artisans, I think, yes, I have spoken to numerous artisans and creative directors who have worked for LVMH brands in the past. And it's an organization, as you can imagine, that's fairly rigid systems in place. And they've complained about the margins, keeping costs down and not being able to do what they really wanted to do. But the two most recent that come to mind when I look at artisans, for example, I was asked about a month ago about a brand or a couple of months ago about a brand called La Tranche and it, they don't have any stockists in London. And a couple of weeks ago, I had to dash out to Paris and my meeting was on the same road that their uh, showroom is on, Rue uh, Saint-Honoré. So I popped into their showroom and their creative director uh, worked at Christian Dior and he's now joined a much smaller organization that's focused on producing the very best. Their designs are different. They're bringing variety into the space. They're using some of the best leathers in the world from Remy Cariat. The hardware is different, it's distinct. And the styles are like none other you have seen. And so you have uh, a situation where a creative director with the know-how, with the contacts has come in and 
he's focused on producing an outstanding product that is bringing variety, high quality, craftsmanship, um, and a level of detail you don't typically get with the aspirational brands. And then you look at creative directors, one I always talk about and I get teased about, loving Joseph de Clos, a brand I particularly like, and that's because consumers are getting phenomenal uh, value from this brand. You are getting arguably the best um, when it comes to the, the leathers use, used, the craftsmanship in the retail space. And you're paying a fraction of what you should truly be getting for the high quality products that are being delivered by Joseph de Clos. And Ramesh Nair, the creative director, cut his teeth at Hermes, then moved to Moina, part of LVMH, and then he's moved on to Joseph de Clos. And with each move, he's just gotten bigger and better. He's improved on his products and he's producing arguably some of his best work now at Joseph de Clos. So creative directors, I think once you've worked in an incredibly rigid environment, directors, artisans as well, moving on either starting your own endeavor or working with a smaller group that's really focused on high quality exceptional craftsmanship and improving on all the things you weren't able to improve on when you're at lvmh when i look at consumers there are two types of consumers there is the consumer that wants to be associated with the lvmh aspirational brands and they will pay the premium because they want to be a part of that whatever it stands for they want to identify with all of that and the recent scandal that broke, um, the Dior scandal, where it came out, there's a bag that's, that costs $58 to produce and retails for $2,800. The $2,800 that it retails for, the, that premium is largely made up of marketing costs, uh, promotional costs, hype costs. Very little of that goes into creating a product that's of exceptional craftsmanship and using phenomenal quality leathers very little is spent on that so it's not the best quality product but that doesn't matter because the consumer who's buying that is really focused on the hype that goes with products from the aspirational uh, brands a couple of days ago i took the first of our summer holidays with my family spent a few days in the south of france visiting friends and one of the days we went to a party island and it was more so because it's something that we typically don't do we've never done it's not our sort of thing but I'm all about experiences, trying something once. And we went to a restaurant called La Gorite on an island, and you can only get there by boat. There's a boat that takes you from Cannes to the island where La Gorite is. And on the way, you see a number of fairly sizable yachts that are moored in the water, and the guests also go to La Gorite. And it's a real party island. It's all about the show. The reviews online are incredibly negative. But it was one of the best lessons I learned. The, the four and a half, five hours we spent there, we arrived about 2.33, left about 7, 7.30 or so. And what I realized was the food is not outstanding, the drinks are okay, but it's all about the hype, it's all about outdoing each other, it's all about the, the, the free-flowing champagne. And there were uh, a lot of people in a fairly sizable dining space that's outdoors, but it's covered. And there were people from many different countries and they all started competing. The Dutch, the Armenians, the Americans, trying to outdo each other and buying magnums or sizable numbers of bottles of champagne. And it wasn't about the champagne. They weren't buying it for the taste or the quality of the champagne. It was purely for the hype. And it was the champagnes that are owned by the LVMH group. Think of Dom Perignon, Moet de Chandon was there. Um, we also have Verve Kiko, uh, Huina as well. And they would have a um, big party. They would have a procession of people who'd come with magnums. Um, they had props. Some came in a big boat, some came in a big bucket. And all of these big show off events were around the region of 30, 40, 50,000 a pop. And they went up in price. The more bottles, I remember the most elaborate, was 40,000 euros for that. And most of the people didn't drink that champagne. It was just about the show and showing off that someone else has done it. We're going to do even better. They didn't really care about the champagne. It was just about the hype that goes with it. Uh, we have 10 um, bottles of uh, Dom Perignon, five magnums, and we've just spent 40,000. What are you going to do? And it was just the most blatant show of wealth. But I realized with luxury, it's not about the cost. It's about the value. And that was a first-hand lesson. It was just 
it was jaw-dropping but i appreciated the event for what it is enjoyed it put it down to experience and thought wow what a powerful lesson i can see why bernard no continues to get wealthy and wealthier and that particular consumer who's focused on the aspirational uh, brands is the one who's going to continue to make Bernard Arnault wealthier and wealthier. Then there's the other consumer. The consumer, for example, is focused on my channel. I have consumers who typically start off buying from the aspirational brands because they associate the premium with high quality. And then they learn over time that is not correct. And then they start focusing on quality and it's the high quality under the radar brands that I'm focused on. And so there are those two types of consumers and getting more consumers to align with quality and focusing on quality and less of the hype. I know you'll never be able to pull away all of the, the consumers who want to associate with hype. That's fine. That's life. But trying to get more consumers to align with quality, appreciate the merits of quality, appreciate that the aspirational brands, it's more of the hype. That premium is hype. It's marketing. It's not quality. It's not craftsmanship. But to focus more on quality, it's under the radar, there isn't a lot of hype, there's very little fuss and fanfare, but you're getting phenomenal quality products. So to answer the question, Bernard needs to be stopped, the statement rather, how are you going to stop him? You're going to stop him when you stop buying his products. That's all it is. Consumers need to realize that they ultimately hold the trump card. They hold all of the power. They wield all of that power. And a lot of consumers feel beholden to the brands. But if you take a stance where you stop buying from the brands because they're not producing high quality and focus more on high quality under the radar, you will slowly over time start to stop Bernard Arnault. You'll certainly make him uh, sit up and pay attention and you may even see improvement in his products. But there are far too many people for him to really change that model just yet. But to stop him, we need more people to focus on um, high quality on the craftsmanship to become more discerning demanding with their money and to go for quality and not for the hype i hope i've answered uh, your comment uh, i've given you my thoughts a bit of mixture i like bernard arno but ultimately i think the power lies with us the consumers as always let me know your thoughts down below